Okay. So I'm going to talk about the mechanism of action in GPM. Now, the first question is, what is the G? And John and I have constant debates about this. And if you know John Gunderson, you know the best way to bond with him is to have an argument. So he likes this. It's good psychiatric management because he's Midwestern, he's humble, and he's trying to tell people the borderline patient is good. They're not evil. They're not trying to torture you. They have an illness that you can understand and treat. And you, too, as a clinician, are good. You can do this. I prefer general psychiatric management. That is the name that was used in Shelley's trial. It ties it to a evidence base that we like to use to justify its use. And it also speaks to the need for generalists to treat these patients, whether they're nurses, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, PCPs, school counselors, whatever they may be. All of these settings should know about borderline personality disorder so that we can intervene early. But what is the evidence base? I tell Shelley she's like the discoverer, the discoverer of GPM efficacy, like the discoverer of lithium. She found out about it kind of on accident by designing such a good study, putting a very robust comparator head to head with DBT. And it was an informed, structured clinical management approach based on John Gunderson's clinical guide. And Paul Lynx converted that into a manual, to my understanding. And they came out with this paper that described its outcomes. And Barbara said, you know, you need to put these things head to head with the same measures. Now, as we know, DBT focuses primarily on self-harm or suicidality when it's there. And both treatments did just as well on these outcomes, even though GPM doesn't really focus on this as a priority. Interestingly, too, interpersonal functioning is the focus of GPM, and they did just as well. Interesting. She followed this up around three years of outcome, perseverance and grit, that's what it takes. But you see here on a number of measures, you can look it up in the journal, um, they look pretty similar. And this is with a lot less clinical resource time. But the problem we face is that while we had a lot of symptomatic remission, we didn't have a lot of functional improvement. A lot of these patients, as Mary had talked about this morning, remained disabled and unemployed. And work was not really emphasized, which I'll get to later, which has been incorporated recently into a number of evidence-based treatments, ours, TFP, I think there's others. So. When we get to understanding what works in BPD treatments, I think every treatment that has an evidence base has a formulation. In ours, we have this formulation of interpersonal coherence as understanding the oscillations in presentation in the BPD patient. So the side that a lot of people talk about is this connected, idealizing, dependent side. This is what families often bring to the table. Remember that version of my child with BPD who is so sweet and smart and appealing and lovable? That's there. But what happens is some interpersonal stress, real or perceived, comes up for all of us, and that brings out this threatened state, which is angry and self-injurious. And that, of course, induces withdrawal of some other people, OK? And some clinicians, too. And so in that state of withdrawal, people get alone. And as John Gunderson wrote about, borderline personality disorder is a problem of intolerance of aloneness. And that is when more of the clinical symptoms that cause acute hospitalizations or emergency room visits occur. And of course, when there's no other person there to be that interpersonal container, there's a lack of holding. And this leads to despair and suicidality in a true sense, not just a reactive feeling of wanting to avoid an escape. Now, if we consider the lack of holding as the thing that triggers the biggest problem in BPD, we can actually create a holding environment. And this happens, that people put patients into the hospital or even the emergency room or sometimes jail. And that holding environment packages in support of others, whether it's the nurse in triage or the doctor that evaluates you or even the people who put you into um, lockup. 
there are other people around suddenly. And that reconstitutes people back to the state. So John would often talk about how patients would look completely out of control one second, end up in the emergency room in hospital, and look like they're comfortable. And this is a model that shows why that happens. Now, this is not a treatment plan, <laughs> because actually this cycle causes iatrogenesis, where people with BPD seek hospitalization to reconstitute themselves. There's some wisdom in that. But we believe the true mechanism, given this model, is to lean in at this state. Now, what we see is the patients are so appealing at this connected state that that's where they get a lot of therapy, or at these states where they're in the emergency room. But what clinicians need to do is lean in here so that they can go back up to that connected place without getting acute symptomatology that's destructive. Some very tolerant partners do this. So the money is this, is that when people are either comfortably or uncomfortably connected, as Claire Brickell put it, they can be trusting. Even the angry patient cares about what you have to say. But when you fall down to these states, that's when they're harder to reach, and they become mistrustful. And this is where any intervention, no matter how elegant it is, is hard to use to help the patient get better. So when we talk about techniques, we have to look under the hood of the car of GPM. What do we actually do? It's not that hard. First of all, we start with diagnosis. So this is a study that a fellow did from Switzerland. Gregoire Rubofsky, that just showed that before and after you give a diagnosis of BPD to people, they don't actually feel more ashamed after they know they have BPD or less likable, but what they do feel is more hope and overall a better sense of well-being. So giving the diagnosis is not a bad thing. And as we know from Mary's work, that Psychoeducation alone about the features of the disorder can help. It's a useful and cost-effective form of pretreatment. So that segues to just something simple called psychoeducation. We can all do it. You don't have to be a therapist. That is saying this is a disorder that gets better over time without necessarily fancy or evidence-based treatments. Evidence-based treatments are great. But the natural course of the illness predicts people will symptomatically remit. Whether they recover or rehabilitate is different. And then teaching them, though, the problem is functioning over time does not improve, as many people have talked about. So that leads to the next mechanism of change, which is accountability. The expectation is that this disorder gets better over time. So if this treatment is working, you're going to get better. We don't do more treatment because you're not doing well. You do more treatment because you're responding to what we're doing in this relationship. And what you really need to do is actually get out of this treatment and get a life. So we all love love, right? Especially like movies, romantic comedies. But you know, in the age of Tinder and selfies that are rather unfortunate, we really try to teach people, whether they're patients or staff members, that you need to get a job. Because this is a fundamental source of identity that is more structured, more regulating, and more um, kind of personality building over time than romantic relationships, which kind of can unseat all of us, right? So as RuPaul said, you better work in our program. But she's a little bit too expensive for us, so we just have John Gunderson say that. <laughs> so that's what's under the hood. But lastly, when we talk about mechanisms of change, we also care about in who. And in GPM, we're starting to study what happens in the clinicians. So there was a paper that Alex Kruglian published on changing attitudes of clinicians pre and post GPM training and one day of oftentimes free training. And what we found was that participants were less likely to avoid borderline patients, dislike them, or believe they were hopeless, and more likely to feel competent 
believe that the borderline patients are not bad but have low self-esteem and feel like they can make a positive difference. Because avoidance is not always wonderful therapy. So this leads back to John's argument, I'll give him a point, that it is that you are good as a clinician that makes a difference. And what this did was de decrease people's fe pressured feeling that they had to become a DBT therapist or an MBT therapist or be completely brilliant psychotherapeutically to make a difference for these patients that are everywhere. So future directions. Luckily, with the help of my partner in crime, Sarah Maslin, whose distinction is NASPD 16 speed dating cha champion. As you know, Boston loves to collect all the sports trophies, so we're going for time two this year. But she's done a study just a couple weeks ago in Miami where we ran a free GPM about, about clinicians' attitudes and physiologic reactivity to BPD. So we thought that people came with negative attitudes and would, that would predict greater physiologic reactivity to BPD-related stimuli and that this would improve over a day of training. So what we did was we provided this attitudes report similar to um, Alex Karulian's paper and we did this um, eSense kind of um, physiological probe. So this is the BPD stimuli. We had actresses say stuff like this, things you hear from borderline patients. Are you fucking kidding me? Here I have been blabbing on about how I'm starting to feel like you re are really on my side and now you're not going to help me? Just when I thought that things were working, I learned who you really are. You don't really care about me. So this is enough to scare any resident and that's who we did this study on. And so basically we got their galvanic skin response and we had them subjectively rate their feelings about these clips. So that will come out after we've culled all the data. So my last word is this, that I think the common mechanism or the basic me mechanism of GPM is to remember common sense when you're hanging out there. A lot of people say, oh, it doesn't have enough evidence, but I always like to invoke this study Parachute use to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenges, a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. Because really the conclusion is a call to broken arms. Only two options exist. The first is that we accept that under exceptional circumstances, common sense might be applied when considering the potential risks and benefits of interventions. The second is that we continue our quest for the holy grail of exclusively evidence-based interventions and preclude parachute use outside the context of a properly conducted trial. So my last slide is that let GPM be your parachute. You can learn it in one day so that we can treat more patients. Thank you very much.